Hey guys, it's your girl Jersey Love Steph, and I hope you're doing really good. Um, let me make sure my interface is on here. There we go. All right. Well, wherever you are, I hope you're doing good. Morning, night, noon. <laughs> the good thing about YouTube is we reach all over the place. Um, my name is Jersey Love Steph, and for Black and Observance of Black History Month, I am reading books to children of all ages. Now, this is Abe Lincoln Goes to Washington. And the reason I'm doing this is because it's Black History Month and Abraham Lincoln abolished slavery. He was assassinated. Um, this book is going to take probably like a good half an hour, but I'm going to flip the camera around and I'm actually going to show you as I'm reading. But what you could do is if you can't get to it all, pause it and then get back to it. If you subscribe to my channel, Ask Mom, if you subscribe to my channel, then you can always, you know, pause and then go back to it, you know. All right. So I'm going to let my dog out for a second. Just give me one second. Okay. Let me go outside. I'll start the beginning over. Well. I'm just waiting for my dog, guys. All right. Feel free to get a drink or something like that. I'm just, um, I'm waiting for my dog to go to the bathroom and then I will be right back. What I'm going to do is I'm going to flip around like this and then we'll look at the book together, okay? All right, so this is Abe Lincoln Goes to Washington. I'm just going to get comfortable here. Make sure you can see it. Maybe I can just put it on my knee. Um, yeah. All right, let's see. Abe Lincoln Goes to Washington. I could do it like that. Just trying to see. All right, so I'm actually going to delete the first part. All right, so my name's Jersey Love Steph, and I'm so glad that you're here. And I'm going to be reading Abe Lincoln Goes to Washington. And um, the reason I'm doing this is because Black History Month is in February in the United States of America. And Abraham Lincoln actually abolished slavery. So he was a very big part of black history. He's a very big part of history in general, but um, he abolished slavery. Okay, so with that being said, um, it's about a half an hour. And this is, um, you can look at the ages, but I would say like second grade to sixth grade, maybe, maybe younger. As long, you can sit through it. You just got to pause it. All right, so. comfortable here. All right, Abe Lincoln Goes to Washington, written and illustrated by Cheryl Harness. These pictures are absolutely beautiful. It says, author's notes, I think if I stare hard enough at these black and white pictures of a long ago president, <clears throat> can I get those gloomy eyes to crinkle into a smile? Hear his voice? What did that wide mouth look like when he laughed? How did the living, colorful Lincoln really look walking down a dusty road? 
What was on your mind, Abe, when you picked when your picture was taken? When you left the photograph photographer studio, put your tall hat on your head. What did the street full of horses and buggies and folks thinking about the Civil War or what's for dinner look like, sound like, smell like? Books are a time machine. Pictures are the key imaginations, the fuel. And I set off to find Mr. Lincoln and his times back upstream in the vanished past. These pictures are just absolutely beautiful. I don't own the copyrights. Okay, here we go, guys. On an April evening in 1837, a tall, lanky fellow, let's see if I can see it, a tall, lanky fellow swung down from his mud spattered horse. He came 18 miles along the Sangamon River from the village of New Salem to the town of Springfield, Illinois. <clears throat> The young man was a representative in the state legislature where he had worked to make Springfield the new state capital. He was a new lawyer too, and he had the papers to prove it, tucked in his tall stovepipe hat. All his books and clothes were stuffed in his saddlebags. When he had carried them up the narrow wooden stairs to a room over the general store, 28-year-old Abraham Lincoln was settled in his new hometown, there to seek his fortune. So it's just really nice pictures. When folks got in legal trouble with land or money, murder or romance, they might come to the law office. Abe shared with his partner, John T. Stewart. Abe practiced politics um, too, and folks came to hear his speeches. He was a fast growing country that needed good he his was a fast growing country that needed good roads and canals. Abe argued all right, let me just let my dog in, guys. I'm sorry. Give me one second. Come on. Come on, buddy. Come on. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that, guys. Abe argued in strong laws. There was a spirit of violence in the land where a man like Elijah Lovejoy of all in Illinois could be killed and get his printing press thrown in the Mississippi River just because he had Yankee anti-slavery opinions. Depend on it, Abe said. If people can do such things and get away with it, this government cannot last. Writing, talking politics, and visiting folks as he traveled between country courthouses, young Abe Lincoln was making a name for himself. Isn't that beautiful? One December night in 1839, Abe slicked down his hair, shined his shoes, and went to a ball. There he was introduced to Miss Mary Todd from Lexington. Abe felt miserably shy and gangly as he bowed to the pretty Kentucky lady. She smiled gaily as she fluttered her fan and asked, Do you dance, Mr. Lincoln? As they whirled about the polish for a merry talk with Abe about books and politics, they soon forgot about his clumsy feet, and so they began courting. They argued and broke up, made up, broke up, and were finally married on November 4th, 1842. Abe had these words engraved on Mary's ring. Love is eternal. Let's see, isn't that beautiful? By 1844, Tank, Tank, come here. By 1844, Abe and Mary were able to buy a house. It sat on the corner of 8th and Jackson Street. Tank, <laughs> Lawyer Lincoln was getting to be known as a man whose ambitions and ideas were extending beyond Illinois. In 1846, he was elected to the United States House of Representatives. The Lincolns left their quiet corner in Springfield. They took their children, four-year-old Robert and baby Edward, on trains, steamboats, and carriages to Washington, D.C. After only one term, Abe and his family came back home to Illinois. He felt like a failure in politics. He and his political party, the Whigs, hadn't agreed with President Polk's popular Mexican war that had won Western land, such as California, for the United States. Abe took up lawyer again. In 1850, the Lincoln's younger son, Edward, died and a new baby was born. Abe and Mary named him William. In 1853, their last child was born. Abe called baby Thomas Tad. 
Abe liked to take his two little boys with him to his law office. Tad and Willie made paper hats, spilled the ink bottles, and stuffed pencils in the spittoons. The neighbors uh, smiled at the window to see long-legged Abe walking home with a bratty boy under each arm. Let's see? <laughs> so my dad, we used to sit on his legs. It says, the Lincoln House was enlarged to two stories in 1856. Beautiful. In Abe Lincoln's America, there was a monster. It was known as the slavery question. In the South, it was legal to buy and sell black people as slaves. Would slavery be allowed in the new states and territories in the West? That's where thousands of folks were going, shoving the Indians out of the way to get open land in California's gold. More and more Northerners were saying no. They didn't want slavery to spread. Some wanted slavery to end. The slavery question was about the rights of black human beings. Were they entitled to the rights and protections in the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution? Or were they just property like the farmer's oxen? There were other conflicts too. People in the North and South had different lifestyles and businesses. They also wanted different things from government. The monster was tearing the country apart. People were fighting mad and shooting and knifing each other along the border between Missouri and the Kansas Territory. Would Kansas be slave or free? The flame of burning homes and barns lit up the night sky. War, cloud, war clouds were gathering. So I don't know if you can see that. This is the slave state, so it's mostly, all right, so you had Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, um, Georgia, Florida, it's all the South, Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina. This is the free state. So where I'm at, New Jersey, it was a free state, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Vermont, New York. Um, I guess this is New York. Yeah, that's New York, right? Maine, uh, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois. And these are territories. Unorganized territory, um, Utah territory, Oregon territory, Nebraska, Indian. Okay. So free territories are free and free men. This is um nice pictures. There he is talking to a bunch of people. So it goes August 21st to October 15th, 1858. Let's see if I can get it. I think this light, let me see if I can shut this one out. And then, maybe it's better. Now I can't see. I'm sorry. August 21st, October 15th, 1858. So it's like two months. Ottawa, Freeport, Jonesburg, Charleston, Girlsburg, Quincy, Otten. Terrible question facing his country pulled A back into politics. A house divided it against itself cannot stand, said A. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. It will become all one thing or all the other, which means it would either be all slaves or free. Because of his speeches against the spread of slavery, the new Republican Party made him a candidate in the 1858 race for the U.S. Senate. The Democratic opposing aide was the short, barrel-chested Illinois Senator Stephen A. Douglas. Noisy crowds came to hear the little giant debate, the toll sucker, in seven Illinois towns. Let each state mind its own business, Douglas thundered. Abe stretched out his long, bony arm to the thousands and declared in his high-pitched voice that black people were entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Slavery was the internal struggle between these two principles. The common right of humanity and the divine right of the kings. It is the same spirit that says, you work and toil and earn bread and I'll eat it. Yes. There's Abe with his children. All right, so that's the Constitutional Union Party, John Bell. Stephen Douglas was Democratic Party. 
Abraham Lincoln was for a re he was a Republican Party, and um, the Southern, which is they were for slavery, was John Breckinridge, Southern Democratic Party. He lost the election to the Senate, but still Mary insisted that her husband would be president one day. She had faith in him, but Abe laughed. Just think of such a sucker as me as president. He laughed and slapped his bony knees, but he didn't fool Mary. See, she knows he has something. Abe made lots of speeches around the country and visited his eldest son, Robert, at school in New England. The argument about slavery grew hotter, so loud and fierce that southern states were talking about breaking away from the Union and making their own country. That would mean war. That's what a civil war of Americans against that a civil war of Americans against Americans. By November 6, 1860, enough Americans saw Abraham Lincoln was moderate enough to make him president of a country that was falling apart. Mary, he exclaimed, were elected. With the news that a Republican president had been elected, southern states began to leave the Union. The government of the United States couldn't just let them go without a fight. The country was facing the unthinkable war with itself. I'll read that in a minute. Hundreds of Lincoln's friends and neighbors sit at the Springfield Railroad Depot on the cold and dismal morning of February 11, 1861. From the back of the train, Abe looked out at the sea of faces and black umbrellas. His long finger stroked the new beard that framed his sad face as he said goodbye. My friends to this place and the kindness of these people, I owe everything. Here I have lived a quarter of a century and have passed from a young to an old man. Here my children have been born and one is buried. I now leave not knowing when or wherever I may return with a task before me greater than which rested upon Washington. Without the assistance of that divine being, whoever attended him, I cannot succeed. With that assistance, I cannot fail to his care commending you. As I hope in your prayers, you will commend me. I bid you an affectionate farewell. Bells clang and wheels grind in the train to Washington chug and whistled out of the station and disappeared in the gray mist and smoke. So long, Abe. That's what he said. So long, Abe. This is, um, Abe got a letter from an 11-year-old girl named Grace Bedell. She suggested that Abe should let his whiskers grow, which is his beard. She wanted him, she thought he should have a beard and to distinguish him probably, you know, because he was, now he's becoming a president. The United States in the beginning of the Civil Civil War, 1861. So that's the um, Southern flag or whatever. Two days before Abe left Springfield on the train, Jefferson Davis, who had been a U.S. Senator from Mississippi, was elected president of the new Confederacy. On March 4th, 1861, on his inauguration day, President Lincoln told the South, in your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war we must not be enemies we wanted to have peace with them isn't that pretty the pictures are so nice as soon as the lincolns moved into the white house 10 year old willie and seven year old tad lincoln explored their new home the white house mice and rats skittered away from them in the cave-like basement in the dark corners of the attic the hallways and stairs were full of men spitting tobacco, juice, and waiting to ask Abe for a government job. Robert Lincoln was a student at Harvard College. His little brother studied at home with a tutor. As they rode their ponies on the ground south of the White House, Willie and Tad watched out for kidnappers and southern spies. They played with Union soldiers who were camping in the East Room in the case the White House was attacked. Soldiers filled the dusty streets outside, too. Up on the roof, Tad and Willie squinted through the spy glasses, watching for rebel soldiers from the south. In the dark before dawn on April 12, 1861, Confederate cannons fired at U.S. Fort Sumter off the coast of South Carolina. The smolder and silver war exploded into flames. President Lincoln called 75,000 militia into active duty. And that was the military. 75,000.
The first battle of the war happened just 25 million, million, 25 miles from Washington at Manassas, Virginia on a July Sunday afternoon. People piled into carriages with parasols and picnic baskets to go see the Billy Yanks lick the Johnny Reps. What they saw and said was a South victory at the nasty, hot, bloody, smoky battle of Bull Run. Cannon thunder shook the ground, gunfire and battle cries. People heard a shivers up your back, holler and wail, the rebel yell. Men and horses were screaming, Union soldiers and panic panickers limped and scrambled back to Washington. Abe listened to the reporters. It was going to be a long, long war. Battle of the Bull Run was in Manassas, um, I guess Virginia, right? On July 21st, 1861. The pictures are just so beautiful. I guess why I love books like this because you can actually pause them, you know. This is General George B. McClellan, um, Gideon Wells, Secretary of the Navy, Simon Cameron, Secretary of War, William Stewart, Secretary of State, President Lincoln, John C. Nicolay, Secretary of, of the Fred. Secretary to the President, John High, other Secretary to the President. So he had John Nikolai and John Hay was his secretaries, and there's his kids, his two little boys. Abe ordered Union ships to blockade Confederate ports and spent money to expand the army without waiting for Congress to say it was okay. He had Southern sympathizers thrown into jail, which is the people that wanted slavery. He made 35-year-old George McClellan the commanding general of his army. People said McClellan was a military genius, and Little Mac, as he was known, agreed. The president was determined to put down the rebellion and save the Union no matter what. This is sad, guys. This is his son. He lost his son. That's terrible. Outside the White House, the weather grew cold and gray as 1861 came to an end. General McClellan drilled the Union soldiers in the mud. Inside, Tad and Willie were sick. Tad got better, but Willie grew worse and worse until he died. Abe looked down at Willie's pale, still face and cried. He said softly, it is hard, hard, hard to have him die. Mary Lincoln wept and tried to talk to Willie's ghost late at night after night. After a night while Abe worked on his sadness for his boy and for all the boys hurt and dying in battle all mixed together. It is really sad. I never knew that he lost his son. I mean, we probably read in school. And then this is the blue and the gray, 1861 to 1862. I'll do that. And then if you come to this. You can just pause it and then, um, you know, look over it, okay? Because I'm going to continue reading. Abe studied books about the art of war and military strategy. He studied the va varnish paper maps that lined the walls of his office and visited the battlefields and hospitals. The Civil War had spread from the Atlantic Ocean to beyond the Mississippi River. Abe grew frustrated with General McClellan, who was painfully slow to attack. Then let Confederate armies and victories get away. The general privately called the president a well-meaning baboon. Yeah, he was he was not a good um, uh, general because he's talking behind the um, president's back. Not good. And there was someone he was trusting. The North needed to win the war on the nation of 1776 with. Wait, the North needed to win the war or the nation of 1776 would be lost forever. The North needed a new strategy. The president knew that Euro European nations might side with the South for business reasons, but they would never get involved in a war about slavery. Abraham Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation on September 22, 1862. When the president wrote that slaves in the rebellious part of the country are and henceforward shall be free, the Civil War became more than a war to save the Union. It became a war for freedom. 
Now, as they had been longing to do, Black Americans were allowed to fight as U.S. soldiers and sailors. The Emancipation Proclamation led to the freeing of slaves with the 13th Amendment in December 1865. Rather die free men than live to be slaves. So they were fighting for their freedom. They weren't allowed to serve before that. They, they weren't allowed to serve in the military. A replaced proud General McClellan again and again with General Burnside Hooker and Meade, always looking for a man who would fight and win. Out in the West, General Ulysses Grant was puffing cigars and closing in on Vicksburg, the rebel fortress on the Mississippi. He captured it at last on the 4th of July, 1863. Now the Union controlled the Great River to the sea. Folks read about it in the Yankee newspapers and about General George Gordon Meade's fierce Union victory at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. They looked for the names of their soldier sons and brothers, fathers, and sweethearts. Were they safe? Were they alive? And I'll do this. And um, you could basically, you know what I'm saying? You can pause it and zoom in. It's beautiful pictures, really. I'll just read this, but you can, like I said, you can um, pause it and then zoom in so you can read it, okay? So it says, after the Confederate victory at Ch Chancellorville, President Jefferson Davis and General Robert Lee decided to invade the North. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia met Union General George Gordon Meade and the U.S. Army of the Potomac in the town of Gettysburg in southern Pennsylvania in that they met in the greatest battle ever fought in the Western Hemisphere. That's um, Squirrel's Magnificent. He actually does reenactment of that. There's a lot of couple channels like that, and they show you they actually get uniforms and stuff. I guess, I think the blue was from up here and the red was from south. I don't want to get it mixed up. So I will, don't take my word on that, please. I have to look. Um an army of 90,000 soldiers, Union soldiers, faced 75,000 soldiers of the South for three hot days in the bloodiest battle of the war. Even when all the young men's grandbabies were in the ground, people would still talk about the brave and terrible fighting at Gettysburg. More than 50,000 men were hurt, missing, or killed. Robert E. Lee's defeated forces headed across the Potomac River back into Virginia. Abe slapping his big hand on the desk with frustration. Union General Meade had no, not chased the retreating rebel soldiers and licked them once and for all. We had them within our grasp, said the grim, tired president. The war might have ended, but now we'll go on and on. He's getting tired. Because, you know, you got the strategy. There he is. Gettysburg Address. November. Now you can pause it in... Um, you can zoom in or whatever. I'll read it. In the autumn of 1863, the president was asked to say a few appropriate remarks. At the dedication of a soldier's ceremony, wait, at the dedication of a soldier's cemetery on the Gettysburg battlefield, Abe and plenty of others thought that his three-minute speech was a wet blanket. It took a while for people to appreciate the Gettysburg Address. Four scores and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the pro proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any other nation so conceived and dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We are met to dedicate a portrait of it as the final resting place of those who have given their lives that the nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our power to add or to detract. There are well, with, the world will very little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work that they have thus far so nobly carried on. It is rather for us to be here, dedicated to the great tasks remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion 
to that cause for which they here gave the last whole measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that the nation shall under God have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people by the people for the people shall not perish from the earth. And like this one, you can um, pause it and zoom in. Okay, or hold still for a minute. Just pause and then you can basically zoom in, okay? All right. Ulysses S. Grant was the Union's top general now in March of 1864. Thousands and thousands of soldiers died as Grant and his men pushed on against General Robert Lee and his troops. When would the, the fighting end? And how in the world could a president get reelected in the middle of a civil war that, that everybody was sick of? Sometimes Abe said, I'm the tiredest man on earth. When the votes were counted in 1864, Abe won his second term in office. The Democratic he defeated was his former commanding general, George McClellan. At his second inauguration, March 4, 1865, Abraham Lincoln said these words. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right. As God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish the just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. The Union soldiers captured the Confederate capital, Richmond, Virginia, on 18, uh, April 3rd, 1865. The very next day, Abe and Tad went there on a small boat. Wrecked ships and dead horses floated in the water. Black people came to greet the president as he walked through the burnt city. Pale faces watched in the window. Abe sat for a moment at Jefferson Davis's desk. What about the conquer people, the president was asked. Let him up easy, Abe sighed. Back home in the White House, Abe had a dream. He saw a coffin draped in black sitting in the Great East Room. Who is dead in the White House? Abe demanded of one of his soldiers guarding the corpse. The president was his answer. He was killed by an assassin. Abe slept no more that night. He had a dream of that he was going to die. General Lee surrendered his gallant tattered army to General Ground April 9, 1865 at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. The war was over at last. More than 2,300,000 men had fought in the many battles. Now soldiers were marching home. In front of the White House, a band was playing. Crowds of people were yelling and throwing hundreds of hats high into the air. It went out to greet them all. Mischievous Tad waved a captured battlefield to the Confederacy from the White House window. When Abe saw it, he, his tired face crinkled into a smile. Play Dixie, Abe said to the band. It's one of the best tunes I've ever heard. And this is really sad. This is Daniel Wilkes Booth, I guess. So, um, Mr. Booth's gone. This is an actual side. Friday evening, five days later, Abe took Mary to see a funny play at Ford's Theater. We we must both be cheerful, said Abe. Between the war and the loss of our darling Willie, we have both been very miserable. That night, an actor who was full of whiskey and anger about the way the war had turned out sneaked into the box where Lincoln's and their guests were sitting. John Wilkes Booth shot his small pistol, leaped from the box onto the stage, then ran to the back of the theater and into the night. He escaped on a gall galloping horse for a time. No, oh no, the president's been shot. The theater was full of screaming, Mr. Lincoln's been shot. It was carried across the street to a little room in a boarding house. That was where he died the next morning, April 15th, 1865. His body was carried back to the White House to lay in the state in the East Room. Soldiers stood watch as 25,000 people slowly walked past Abe's black draped coffin. There was a train that carried him. It's terrible.
terrible. He didn't waste his life, though. Never before had an American president been murdered. In the aftermath of the shooting, John Wilkes Booth was killed, and those who plotted with him to kill the president were hanged or put in prison. Vice President Andrew Johnson became the 17th president as the 16th became a legend. The tall, skinny, poor boy, the frontier tree chopper, the flatboat man with only a year of proper school, the village shopkeeper and country's lawyer became Father Abraham, the emancipator, the president who saved the union. A funeral train carried a Lincoln back to Springfield, Illinois. All along the way, people paid their respect with poems and flowers. In between the towns and cities, people sit along the tracks listening for the lonesome whistle of the funeral train. They said silently as President Lincoln's train passed by. So long, Abe. And that's it, guys. That's um the book. And that was Abe Lincoln Goes to Washington by Cheryl Harness. It's um, written by her and it's um, illustrated by her. And it was read by me, Jersey Love Steph. If you enjoy stuff like this, the books, I plan to do this again. Can you please subscribe to my channel and like it? If you can, share it out. I don't know for kids if you can share it or whatnot. But um, I hope to see you back, guys. And I plan on doing this. So if you enjoy this, I hope to see you again. All right. Take care, guys.